Good evening. Uh, my name is Bobby Elias, and as chairman of the speakers program, I'd like to welcome you to what is our first nighttime program. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, Peter Fonda as our guest tonight. Uh, and he, we are going to do a question answer period where you can ask about anything you want, I guess. <laughs> and uh, we will probably be talking about Easy Rider, probably, and his new movie, uh, The Hired Hand, and uh, probably people that have made uh, Easy Rider. Uh, it's interesting, I, I think, to note that. Uh, Jack Nicholson is uh, doing, you know, you're like the Beatles, you made a good you had a good thing and then you split up, you all, now you're all doing other things. Uh, so Dennis Hopper's doing the last movie, which if it's a big hit, uh, will be just the first movie for him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's Nicholson and there's Terry Southern, who, who knows what he does. Okay, so let's just, uh, there's, we have some roving mics that uh, we'll have. So just raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get the mic to you. There's somebody with a raised hand. Scream the question. If anybody can't hear it, they'll tell me, and I'll tell them what the question was. He can't hear me. <laughs> hold, hold on a minute. We have, we do have a mic. Let's just. Get, oh, there it is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hold, hold, no, hold on, just a minute. Uh, there's the mic over there, and there's one over here. Uh, just could you bring it to the people who, who have a raised hand? That's it. Can you hear me when I'm speaking without the microphone? No, no, this guy wants to ask me a question. Not hey, hold on, just a minute. Uh, I really want to ask you to use the mic, because we're mm -hmm. taping this, and we want to get it on, the questions on tape, okay? Yeah, we're a little slow with the mics. Uh, <laughs> Come on down to my office sometime. <laughs> we're slow with everything. Oh, uh, great. Is this on? Okay, here we go. <laughs> um... As everybody, uh, well, as a lot of people think, um, Spiro Agnew um, turns old people um, against young people. And uh, it's been my experience that um, your movie Easy Rider has made a lot of uh, young people, myself included, very, very suspicious of old people. I mean, uh, I was hitchhiking around the United States for a few months, and very often, uh, I felt like I was going to get murdered, and <laughs> I didn't really think there was a rational reason for it, um, except for sort of a mood that I really think was created by your movie. I met a lot of people, and uh, when we talk sort of about um, fears hitchhiking, the, your movie would always uh, come up. Could you comment on that? I mean, does it at all concern you that you <coughs> might be creating that kind of feeling? Oh, yeah, it concerned me before I made the movie. Uh, Spiro Agnew, huh? <laughs> well, I think he just confuses the issue. And uh, although what you felt about my flick and the way it affected you is valid for you, it's not necessarily what I had to say or Dennis had to say. We had no intention of turning young people against old people. As a matter of fact, uh, we very rarely got into the old person problem with the exception of the, the goons who finally kill us and beat up Jack Nicholson. Uh, we presented the problem in our own way. We were young people. Uh, our problem was looking for freedom, and our answer was not found. We, weren't, we had nothing to do with freedom. Riding motorcycles and smoking dope and all that had nothing to do with freedom. Our whole trip had nothing to do with freedom. And that's what it was all about, you know. Nothing about the old and the, the young. I'm sorry that you have a bum feeling hitchhiking, but I tell you, you know, I fly only because it's faster. And I have a bum feeling flying. <laughs> and it's not about dropping out of the sky like a rock. It's, I know what's on, going on down below. Um, you may excuse it as part of my movie that makes you feel that way. But uh, it would take us a long time, but I could describe to you what fear is and where it originated from, and uh, I may have stimulated it in you about this country and what could happen to somebody just footloose on the road. But that was true a long time ago, and will probably be true for a long time, or at least another three and a half years. Was that a interesting? Was that a confusing question and answer thing? It was. Yeah. 
Let's right. try it again. Uh, you have another question. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay, yeah. man, boogie. If, if you can't hear me too well, I have a very bad cold, and uh, you'll have to excuse that. Ah, energy. Water. There's acid in it. There's no acid in it, no. 72% of our body, pure water. I have a feeling it has something to do with energy. First of all, did, uh, was Easy Rider originally written as a script, or did you just grab the camera and start shooting? Did you have a script? It was a full script. It was a full script. Mm -hmm. Uh, it originated just as an idea that popped into my bird when fear wasn't acting there. <laughs> uh, the other question I want, well, I had a couple. Um, Buggy. I've heard uh, the Easy Rider being referred to as the modern western heading east on motorcycles. <laughs> 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 Could you make a comment on that? That's sure. Funny. Dennis and I always wanted to make journey to the east and we couldn't get the property from the Hesse family. And uh, as a matter of fact, we wanted to do a Western because the Western was the best uh, form for drama and tragedy. But we had to, uh, we felt we wanted to do it this way. The images were important. Motorcycles, machine, machinery, all the flag stuff and the chrome. It has more of a statement about what's happening today in a theater that's not removed like Greek theater is. Although it's funny, I just did finish a Western, but it has its own things for me. I did, I did it for myself, you know. And I did Easy Rider for myself, and Dennis and everybody else who did it. No. But, um, it was intended to be like a Western. It was intended to have that same kind of flow and frontier feeling. The last question I wanted to ask you was, uh, I read your art, uh, the article in Playboy magazine, <laughs> and... <laughs> so did Al Cap. did you read it? <laughs> Far out. But uh, you seem to have gotten into, um, for lack of better words, an ecology kick, expressing ideas of uh, what you saw happening in the future, and I was wondering what you thought might be the possibility of film and having effect on people's outlook on what is happening in this country and maybe with the ecology trip or whatever trip you would like to talk about, really. Well, knowing how long it takes to make a movie, I think it's a waste of time to concentrate on this country. Even though this country is a microcosm, but not even that, it's greater than that, uh, of what's going on all over the globe. Uh, and it's not a kick, the way I feel about ecology. I may have been glib or edited uh, editedly. Yeah. I may have been edited to sound glib about my ecology stance. Uh, I'm quite militant about it. I have children. And there won't be any water for them to drink in a few years. No, that does not sound like, I mean, you know, I don't mean to sound joking or anything like that at all. I'm very serious about it. I want to boogie out of this place. I think you're all fools for wasting your energies this way. In a way, I don't mean to insult you, but there are teachers that give you classes that you should be asking questions to, and not people like me. And my sister's out talking to a lot of people, doing stuff. Um, she says, power of the people and the Black Panthers, and, but she doesn't understand there won't be any water or air. She thinks I'm a romantic for saying that. <laughs> Well, I'm not a romantic, and there won't be any water or air. All right, can we go on to have a next question, please? I hate to change the subject from your ecology trip, but I've got two questions about Easy Rider. First of all, is it true that like a lot of the scenes turned out to be just ad lib things, like um, like the scene in the restaurant with those chicks and everything? And like, just, I heard that a lot of the scenes were really not meant to be filmed, but that they actually happened, and they just turned out being in a picture. <coughs> Well, in the scene in the restaurant, written in the script, says that we come in and uh, there's some girls at a table drinking Dr. Peppers or whatever. And there's some other guys sitting at other booths and tables and they start making comments about us. 
and we wait to be served or have somebody ask us for something or to get something to drink and eat. If we don't get served and the hostilities grow, this is what's written in the paper. The people say things like, look at their hair. Boy, they smell. And the girls giggle and uh, ask us if they can go for a ride. That was the extent of scene number 56A or whatever the thing was in the script. When we walked into the restaurant, which Dennis had gone in before, and he liked it because of the mirrors. He could lay a dolly track and show two things happening at once. There was a bunch of guys sitting there. The girls had already been you know, told to come. But there was a bunch of guys sitting there who didn't know about it. And we walked in, just like you saw us in that flick. And this guy said, hey, look at that guy there with that long hair. They're talking about Dennis, because he was really the most outrageous of us all. <laughs> I can smell him. Can you smell him? So in a way, it was an ad lib sequence, but in a way, it was written. And it's been written before. My other question was, in the very first scene in the movie, when, you know, like in order to get the money to make this trip, you guys went on wherever you went to Mexico or whatever it was. Was there a purpose behind like you're selling dope to get the money? Was there like a little reason in there or something or was, you know, like I was wondering why you incorporated this into your way to get money. Was there any sp uh, specific reason for it? Um, it's considered an immoral act to traffic in narcotic drugs, although we never said what it was. It was supposed to be cocaine. That's Dennis and me because we find cocaine uh, a romantic drug a narcotic. It breaks the blood vessels in your brain and then like would, would it's you also be saying, a poison. Would you be saying then that your whole like your whole ambition for the whole trip was an immoral thing? Because like you're saying like it was an immoral thing to start with. An exposure of the American dream is an immoral thing. Make a lot of money no matter who goes down and then retire. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, there's a story that goes around that when you decided to make Easy Rider, well, I heard this from one of the, uh, one of the chairman of the uh, film department here. He was saying that it happened at a meeting where Jack Fellaini was talking to some of the filmmakers. <laughs> and he said that uh, there were too many movies which had sex, violence, drugs, motorcycles, and what they needed was more movies such as Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> uh, that's true. As a matter of fact, I taped that whole thing. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. That, that's true then. I had a big shotgun mic and an auger, and I sat there pointed right at him. And, uh, uh, well, I, I'd like you to comment a little bit on that. And secondly, uh, if, if that is true, I understand that you did make your film on a very low budget, and uh, this would tend to indicate a new trend for filmmaking. And I wonder if you'd also comment a little bit on the uh, present trends in filmmaking and, you know, where do we go from here, you know? I mean, you know, the, the old Hollywood-type movies with the big stars and stuff seem to be out the window. And uh, I just wonder if you can comment on that. Well, about Jack, I'm not sure your question about Jack Valenti, other than uh, my comment on Jack Valenti and what he had to say about the making of movies. It just occurred to me that uh, the movie he used for an example of the movie we should make was a total waste of money. At the moment he made his speech, he said it cost $27 million to make Dr. Doolittle. Later, they revised it to $72 million. And they gave me a gold lighter for coming up there. And I said, uh, the only time... 27 or 72 million should be mentioned is in the box office, not the budget. But I was talking to a bunch of theater owners and they make their money from the box office, not the budget of the films. So I had like a thousand people on my side right away. And I said, so it seems to me that we should make a movie about motorcycles and drugs and sex and violence because that would be reflecting what's happening. And our only uh, requirement would be to deal with it honestly as individuals, not as a mass. I was wondering, uh, when I, I saw the movie in a class and uh, it seemed to be the professor uh, afterwards, we, we had a discussion on the scene where you're sitting around the campfire and uh, Dennis Hopper is ejaculating over how great it is. And then you say, no man, we blew it. Uh, one interpretation of that I heard was that it was the third or fourth uh, take and uh, you didn't get it right. And no. <laughs> and you said, <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> that's not it. Is <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's much further out than that. Um, Dennis and I were sitting in a Cortez, you know, one of those little 
mobile homes. We had forgotten to shoot the scene. <laughs> so we got it together with the crew, and we went out with a few people to shoot this last scene. Dennis says, my God, what are we going to say? And I said, I don't know. He said, what do you want to say? And I said, I want to say we blew it. He said, well, you've, you've, got, you've got to say this thing about, like, we blew it because we did this, which is part of your question about my act, immoral act. I said, no, I don't want to talk about that. And he said, well, I want you to say we blew it. We blew our inheritance, our heritage, when we went for the easy money. So I did for the first take. And then he said, no, you're right. And explains it too much. He said, just say we blew it. So I said, we blew it for 14 takes. <laughs> and he said, what? Every take. And I said, we blew it. Uh, my motivating, this is a secret. <laughs> my motivating factor behind that whole thing was that I figured we had blown the movie. Uh, I didn't think it was going to end up the way I wanted it to. I meant by we blew it many things. And I did not want to be specific. But we blew it because we won't have water in three and a half years. Or we blew it because we cannot uh, deal with the situations in the world the way rational people should. And we call ourselves rational people. Now we is us, not them. All of us. All right, can we take the next question? Uh, we have some over here. Let's take them. Peter, after working with and getting to know Jack Nicholson, what did you think of the movie and performance by him in Five Easy Pieces? I liked it very much um, until he went home. Yeah. Um, do you know the, the girl who played his, uh, the dumb southern broad in that flick? Sure, she played the whore for us in uh, Easy Rider. She is, was... Uh, is she... Is she... A, it was, hard, it was hard for me to tell. She did a really fine job. Is she She's a, a brilliant is actress. Is she a brilliant actress or just she a dumb southern broad? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she, she is a, a brilliant actress. She's not a dumb southern broad. And uh, just the little thing that she did for us in Easy Rider was an amazing gig. As a matter of fact, also uh, in that film was Tony Basil, the dark-haired little girl with the, the freak who was talking about mm -hmm. dumping trash all over the place. Mm -hmm. She played the other whore, and she's a fine dancer, a choreographer, too. Then you, then you think the uh, ending of that movie kind of missed, kind of blew the flick? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's hard to say. I went in up. I went in feeling this has, got, this has got to be good. I knew all the people who had made it, and I wanted it to be very good. But for me, it wasn't. For whatever reason, I don't know. It just wasn't. But, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to criticize the film, really. I think it should be seen. Can you explain the use of the Catholic Hail Marys during the trip sequence? Yeah, no, religious symbolism. <laughs> uh, I happen to feel that symbolism plays a great part in uh, developing and stimulating people used properly could be accidental but it can still be used properly in the editing room film is one of those great things like uh, you can fool around with it after you've shot it and even change it then we wanted to have this little uh, religious symbolic endeavor of the girl reading the Hail Marys while I was sitting on a Statue of Liberty's lap asking my mother why she copped out on me we shot that with that religious symbolism in mind. The heaviest religious symbol in that, uh, in that scene was when we came up to take the pill. And I broke it open and gave it to everybody, and then we passed the wine around. That one, we didn't talk about that. We just went in and did it. You know, and the camera was running. It was on a rehearsal we were shooting. And uh, turns out there was a little communion there. It's pretty good. Religious symbolism. What does it mean to you? I, I wasn't sure if, you know, the LSD trip was supposed to be sort of a religion to you. No, no. Or, yeah. It was just a, it was something. We didn't say it was LSD that either, you know. It was just a pill, a little white thing. As a matter of fact, you couldn't even see what it was. 
because it was so grainy and out of focus. <laughs> but um, it wasn't one a day, that's for sure. It wasn't one a day, but you know, the horse's name was Mary. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, uh, who who uh, edited the film? Dennis Hopper, Bert Schneider, Bob Rafelson, me, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and <Jack> okay. <laughs> and uh, the man who got the credit for it. <laughs> we were all editors. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, if I may, I'd just like to reflect on you for a minute. Uh, <laughs> you know, what you said about, you know, I'm not really into your movie. I mean, I, was, I saw your movie and I dug it, but you just mentioned something about the American dream. That's making money. And like, is that your thing? I mean, is that like, the, beyond, you know, behind the long hair, and the beard, is it, is it the bread that you're into, or, I mean, are you really... See the magic word and split a million dollars. <laughs> you know, like I saw you... Well, listen, here's how I feel about it, in a nutshell. First, I'm an anarchist, I don't belong to any party or any country. I happen to have an American passport. California is where my driver's license exists because that's where I took my test. I won't burn a flag because that's a waste of my energy. I won't blow up a building because that's a waste of the building. But I know that the building is not greater than the builder. And uh, I'm playing a game of Monopoly. I mean, like Spiro I mean, Agner. Do you dig it? What I'm just it, playing what, like a game. Do you understand what it is to think that the building is greater than the builder? Then it becomes life is a game when it's lived on that level. That's 99% of the people on the, on the world. Actually, I'm spending the millions he's making from the movie to buy water. Uh, no, that's <laughs> not true. That's not true at all. I don't mind the money I made from the flick at all. I didn't think about making money with the flick. I just knew that we would make a movie who wouldn't, that wouldn't lose money so we could make another flick. But my personal thing about money... I mean, you live in a big house, right? And, uh, no, it's a small house. I mean, like, is it, it must be expensive, I read in Playboy. No. They had a tennis court and all that shit. And, and, uh, well, what and happened you know, was... And like people have tennis courts. It used to be the part of a big house, and they sold off the tennis court and the little house that was on the tennis court, and I played frisbee on the tennis court. And my kids ride their bicycles around. But don't try to make me justify my life for you. I'm not that. trying to. I'm just asking well, you. No, you are, but dig what I'm saying. We're in involved in a monopoly game as far as our social and... Uh, civilized life is concerned. It's not a truth life game. Otherwise, we would not be here in this building right now listening to a fool like me. Because we're wasting our energies. There's a lot to do. An awful lot. And there's a lot to overcome and a lot of people to get it together with. But the rest of it's monopoly, man. I'd be a fool if I didn't pick up 200 bucks when I went past go, right? <laughs> I mean, that... <laughs> It's either that or I'm not going to play the game and I'm boogieing on out of here. Where are you going? Africa. <laughs> it's okay. the only place I know in the hemispheres that will have clean enough atmosphere and water where there will be any sort of civilization, a chance to begin and find uh, freedom. I don't know if freedom can ever exist in man, but a chance. Africa, how about that? <laughs> yeah, all us white is going all the black people, man, in Africa. Huh? Uh, that's, the, that's the oppression place where they oppress all the black people that you're sort of putting down in, in your movie, weren't you? The oppression bit? Weren't that's the oppression down? of what? Weren't you putting down oppression in your movie? Oh, yeah. And then that's Africa, though, isn't sure. it? Sure. So, like, you're not going from... I mean, that's not the place to go, Africa, if you, if you don't dig America. Do you think there's any place in this world where there is an oppression? Maybe in your own head, even. Do you think you're free from that in your head? No. But I don't think I can boogie on out to any place else that's... that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm only... I'm not boogieing there for freedom from oppression or anything else. And as a matter of fact, I don't think of freedom from anything as being freedom. I'm boogieing on over there to have something to eat and drink and something to breathe and a place for my children to uh, grow up because they won't do it here. Can we have the next question over there, please? Yeah, I have uh, two questions. I'll ask them one at a time. Could you speak uh, up, please? Yeah, I have two questions. Um, I saw you on one of those talk shows, and I believe you said you were arrested for quoting part of the Declaration of Independence. That's not true. 
No, I, I quoted part of the Declaration of Independence and they took it out of the show. But I was never arrested. I see. As a matter of fact, well, I went through a whole trial and never got arrested. Why did they take it out of the show then? Well, actually, it, as a matter of fact, it wasn't even the preamble. It was uh, Lincoln's second inaugural address in which he says, if you're not satisfied with the government, it's your constitutional right to change Congress or your uh, revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow it. That was one of the presidents of the U.S. in his second inaugural address. But if ah. you guys haven't learned that and heard that yet, <laughs> you all must be sitting like this. Does, do you talk to your teachers in your classrooms? <laughs> Why don't you start talking to them, ask them if they've read the book? They're not interesting? I don't believe that. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been uh, through the South before Easy Rider, but uh, what impression did the South give you? There were bullet holes in every car that I saw. <laughs> um, the cops seemed to have it better together than anybody else, which surprised me. And people are people. Uh, the only reason we went through the South and Easy Rider is because we wanted to go to Florida as part of the American dream. We could have gone anyplace else in this country or any place in the world, for that matter. Uh, my, impression, my impression of the South. Uh, well, you see, Texas, uh, we didn't even shoot in Texas. We just boogied on through. Was that right? <laughs> went right into Louisiana because we were afraid to shoot in Texas. Bobby Kennedy just got shot when we were in Texas, in Wichita Falls, with the big sign that says, Welcome, John Wayne, wherever you are. Texas to me is H.L. Hunt. H.L. Hunt to me is uh, the thing that oppresses. Do we have the next question? In um, Playboy magazine, it said that you don't, um, uh, you don't have many interviews, you don't come to the public too much. I was wondering why you came here tonight and saying that, you know, you thought it was kind of a waste of us to be here, why would you come anyway? Well, I couldn't really hear all you said except why did I come here tonight, and that's what I was going to ask all of you. Yeah. I and uh, I was trying to find a way to say it so it wouldn't seem glib or funny where you would understand I really want to know. I you all first. think you know me, you see, and I know I don't know you. I'm in an advantage position in one sense. I'm in a disadvantage because of this thing here and uh, all this stuff between us. But you have an idea of me already. So I came here to learn something else about me and about you because it's all us. But I'm curious about why anybody would want to come and listen to me speak. How would you feel if you got here and there was nobody here? Much better. <laughs> <laughs> there would have been somebody here. Cass would have been here. If I would have known that, we wouldn't have done any advertising. <laughs> uh, can we have the next question here, please? Uh, Peter, um, this may sound a little ludicrous. Uh, it may sound a little ludicrous, but um, do you consider yourself a filmmaker by profession? Yeah, that's my Monopoly gig. Okay. I happen to be able to enjoy it and get beyond the Monopoly game in film. Well, if you were offered, um, say, a, a large budget by a film company to make a relevant picture, would you take it? A large budget, yeah, if I could make an, eco uh, an ecology flick about the world. Okay, would you like to become the, you know, like a Selznick of Hollywood? Um, if, if, you know, you don't have to go making uh, Gone with the Wind or King Kong or anything like that, but <laughs> would, would you like to become a Hollywood tycoon in your own way? No, Not no. a tycoon, but a Hollywood... Uh, I know what you mean. You would like to, you know, I, I mean, no, I know what you... Even parts of the question that you don't know. Um, I'd like to become Peter Fonda, you know. Uh, and a question, that, that, that question was asked me in Easy Rider two and a half years ago by uh, Luke Askew. He says, did you ever want to be anybody else? And I said, no. I lied. Just before I answered the question, I was about to say I always wanted to be the Everly Brothers. <laughs> I should have said that, too, because I really did want to be the Everly Brothers at one point in my life. Only I wanted both of their voices to come out of my mouth. <laughs> I didn't want to have to relate to anybody else to do it because I sure, but I wanted to sing and play guitars. Well, I mean, if you had the money and, and you know, and you had the, the go-ahead to make the kind of films that you wanted to make, would you, would you like to set up the Fonda Studios in Hollywood or wherever, you know, sit no. in Africa or something like that? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, for me, no, I, no, you see, the whole place is a studio. And as long as there's a place to rent a camera and process film, I've got it together. As far as the money is concerned, uh, before we started editing Easy Rider, it cost us $265,000. I'm about to get into a deep lawsuit because of that from the unions. <laughs> and as far as wanting to be Selznick, one of the gigs, of course, was to shoot that whole thing down. Uh, and the last, last part is, uh, I heard rumors that Dennis Hopper is suing you for uh, certain uh, money problems that went along with Easy Rider. Is that true? And w w well, he was answer? suing me, yeah. You guys, uh, I read out? about it in the papers one morning just before I went to work. And, uh, <laughs> and I called him on the phone and I wanted to see if he was going to say anything about it because I know the only way it gets into the papers is if you have somebody announce it. You know, UPI. So it was an announcement from his people. For a long time I was very curious why Dennis was suing me. He said, I have three and a half points more than he does. Well, that's retained by my company. They spent a lot of money beforehand during the making of the picture and afterwards defending the lawsuits we got into because of Dennis. And I finally figured it out. Dennis, for 13 years, he talked to everybody about how he was left out and people stole his ideas and nobody would let him work and he was not wanted and how he blackballed and Henry Hathaway kicked him out of the industry and all of that. And suddenly, everything happened for him that he ever wanted, and he didn't know how to relate to it. So it was much easier for him to come back and say, you see, I'm still the oppressed, misunderstood, everybody hates Dennis Hopper. Are you guys still friends? Sure. Okay. I just think he's crazy. And, but you see, the whole idea is there's a lot of crazies. How to use the crazy is the best. That's the question. Right, could we go for a question there, please? OK, you talked about escaping and getting out of America, let's say, and going to Africa or something. Could you, could, could you extend it and say, like, how you're going to get it there in Africa and how you're going to go about it? I'm going to sail. You're going to what? Sail in a boat. No, no, no. Sail. I mean, could you tell us something more than, like, getting fresh water and fresh air? I mean, there's philosophies that underlie, well, I think there's philosophies that underlie, like, what's going on in America and stuff. And could you, could you um, say what, how you'd like to change it in Africa for you? Change it in Africa? Oh, brother. That's a, oh, I don't know. How, how I may gonna, never make it to Africa. How is it going to be different? I may never get out of this house, out of this hall. Um, are you asking me why I don't stick it around here and try to get it together here? That's part of it. Get in a sinking ship. Mm -hmm. Find the leak if you can. The leak in the hole of this boat is so large that your finger won't put, do a thing. Could you be more Would exact? You? I mean, okay. This, I mean, the the place is blown. I can't swear now because we're on tape, huh? <laughs> you can swear. It's yeah, fucked, it's okay. man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we blew it. Not serious. It's not funny. It's not to be taken lightly. And we're misusing our energies this very moment. All of us here in this room and all of us in this country and all of, this, all of us on this planet. Why doesn't it stop? I just stopped. All right. Uh, let's have the next question here. Is that, is that was a question? Yeah, I, oh, I have a trinity of uh, questions, I actually. Uh, I happen to think these uh, type of sessions might be productive. The first thing I'd like to ask is if you would care to rap sincerely to us for a minute or two about dope. About what? About, about dope? Could you, re could you repeat the last word? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it rhymes, it, it rhymes with hope. Oh, yeah, yeah well, you've oh, got it. Come the on. Pope, uh, right. The speakers. No. Yeah, right, about dope. Well, about dope and the Pope. Pope's dope. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mind talking to you about it. And the kind of sessions where it's, you're able to uh, use energies uh, happen when there are much fewer people. There are many too, uh, too many people to really uh, learn and give and take and exchange and communicate. Uh, dope. How do I feel about vodka? How do you feel about vodka? Dope. 
What do you want to know about it? Well, I sort of wanted to know where your head was at about it, and uh, you oh, I smoke it. Reluctant to uh, elaborate. Uh, I smoke it. <laughs> okay. What else do you want to know about it? Well, what, what's the stuff? Uh, what there's got to be something else. I'm feeling that there's, yeah, there's I'm, got I'm to be something you, else than your, your uh, question about grass, because that's a really silly question. Sure, I'm after your ideas on, uh, on what social significance or lack of it or revolutionary or counter-revolutionary aspects you think it might have. I think it's, a, it's a, um, an example of something, the use of it and the misuse of it and the reaction to the use of it from all sides. I think it's an example of civilization. Uh, did you use real heroin in the movie? That was cocaine. Oh, no, cocaine. it was the powdered sugar. Oh, God, my nose hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but it was real dope. Does that answer part of your question? <laughs> well, yeah, it does. So the second one would be uh, the type of freedom you were talking about in, in Easy Rider. Do you think that this, uh, this can be attained? And uh, would you care to elaborate on, uh, on what qualities this type of freedom has and how one might go about attaining it? Well, I don't know about the last part of it, and it's a, it's a very tricky, long thing, and it's something that is only achieved by perception, direct perception, not something I can tell you or anybody else or that you find in any books. Um, but I happen to think that freedom's the whole gig, and uh, that learning is freedom, and that the only thing that gets in the way of that is fear. That's as simple as I can be about it. You may or may not understand it, but that's how I feel about it. Uh, Casey says that the problem is, uh, is insanity, and I believe he means the problem uh, in attaining freedom. Would you uh, at all equate uh, fear with, uh, with insanity, or do you think that they are related, or...? Oh, yeah. And seeing as we all have fear, that makes us all crazies. It's to a degree. My final question would be, uh, what uses do you think that the bread we, uh, we pick up, pass, and go might be put in our society? What uses? The what? Do you, you see any productive uses that money can be put to, uh, other than, of course, making films? Well, yeah. How many billions are they spending now over in Vietnam? And uh, they can't help the people in East Pakistan, which is only a few hundred miles away. They got all those helicopters, all those personnel, and they can't help out those people who just got devastated. Maybe a million people were hit. That's one place you could use money. Cost money to buy the gasoline because those idiots won't give it away. They give away stamps. And so far, they're giving away water. <laughs> so far. I have the next question over here, please. I read an article that while filming Easy Rider, you and uh, Dennis Hopper got some fisticuffs. And if so, I'd like to know who won. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only hit one dude in my life before, really. Uh, and I gut punched him when he made a foul comment about a chick that I was digging. That was when I was a lot younger. Uh, no, I never got any fisticuffs with Dennis. He's crazier than I am, and I'd never fight a crazy man. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I'd rather promote the image that I'm crazy, so nobody wants to fight me, either, you know, because a lot of people are walking around with guns and knives. But no, he, he, uh, he's never swung at me. He may have thought about it, <laughs> but you know, he used it some other way. Can we uh, take a question here? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is I'm just curious about the title, Easy Rider, sort of whether there were alternative titles you thought about, and sort of just thinking of it in the sense of Easy Rider, it wasn't such an easy ride. Uh, just sort of who came up with the title? Terry Southern. Oh. Terry Southern came up with the title. Easy Rider is an old Southern term. Uh, it means uh, the man who lives with a whore. Not the pimp, but the dude who lives with her. And she pays for it. And he's got the easy ride. And uh, if we're the easy riders, the whore's liberty, and we're popping beers in front of television sets. That was what that whole thing was all about. There were alternative titles but they were all goof-around titles. It's not worth talking about here. But Easy Rider is an interesting title. Yeah, uh, the other thing I was thinking of was 
about uh, a couple of months ago, I heard uh, uh, Godard, the French uh, filmmaker back east, uh, talking about his films. And uh, what made me come up here was at one point, he said to everybody sitting out there, he says, you know, what, what are you doing here? What, why did you come to see me? And uh, when people sort of said, you know, he, he asked specifically, there was just a girl sitting in the front row, and he just sort of pointed out and said, what are you doing here? And she said, well, you're, you're sort of a movie star. You know, you're a famous director. And he proceeded to chew her out and, and tell her that, you know, that, that that's, that was no reason to be there. Uh, and that, you know, she should, you know, and she said, what, what do you, she asked him, no, he asked her what, uh, you know, where, what her political uh, beliefs were. And she said, well, she didn't have any. She was just going to school. She was just going to school? She was just going to school. Did you see Satyricon? No. Um. <laughs> and he said, you know, that was, that was bullshit. Um, what, what I'm thinking of after that was, was he really, people began to ask him what he thought of his earlier films. And uh, what I'm getting at is like the role of the filmmaker today. Now, he sort of dismissed every film he's made up until the last one or two as just sort of bourgeois bullshit and, and just really nice. And like Easy Rider was a very nice film and just said a lot of things about current day lifestyle. But uh, do people ask you, say, how come you're not, you know, making films that are going to I mean, say something really relevant about social change, like, I'm a filmmaker myself, of sorts, and uh, the things that I've made have been, have, have to do with, with beauty and, and just sort of art and things like that. And whenever I show them to my friends in New Haven, Connecticut, where I live, where the Bobby Seale trial is going on, I sort of say, you know, ask them to look at the film sort of apologetically, sort of like, you know, like I realize, you know, this is just bullshit to you, but, and all my friends that are making films back east, they're sort of all, you know, all doing radical political things, all doing things about ecology. Uh, it's a really long question. Well, no, I, you know, but no, perhaps but you have to be stimulated to find a question. What do you really want to know? Because <laughs> I w I I'm know. not Godar. An Easy know. Rider was made two and a half years ago, and uh, I said everything about it that I have to say, and I'm just repeating myself over and over I again. I want to know, are you going to make any films that take a political stance where people are really maybe going to come down hard on you for saying something? Well, I did, and I'll continue. And political stance can be interpreted. And I just made a Western, which I feel deals with uh, part of the problems of civilization and society, which is the, bi the basis for political action. Well, but I'm not Godard, you know, yeah. and I don't intend to be, and I don't want to apologize, although I always say don't see Tammy in the schmuck face. <laughs> for anything I've done beforehand, I'm only six years old, and I have a lot to learn, and not enough time to learn it. And what do I want to know about political change in this country, or any country? Do you belong to a political party? I don't. Um, I, I do. I, I, don't, I don't vote either because, to me, there aren't really any real choices. I mean... I know. do. I vote for school bonds and stuff like that. I vote to legalize marijuana. Legalizing marijuana is something you can do for yourself. You don't need <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, uh, would you would you like to talk a little bit about your new movie, The Hired Hand? Uh, just tell us a little bit what it's about, what to expect. Is that a toughie? Well, I'm in the midst of editing, and it's frustrating enough for me because uh, I'm not behind the editor's back every day. I work in my own way, and I'd be a fool not to let the editor really use all of his talents when it comes to fine cutting. I'll be right there and say, no, 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 eight frames of that. And we may or may not argue about it. So it's like um, delivering the child that all these people who are part of the company that made Easy Rider, I mean, um, Hired Hand, and to talk about it now, 
it's, it's rather difficult. Only generally is it possible, I suppose. And I don't know if that's interesting or not, or even yeah. stimulating. Yeah. And I think there's some people who have some questions that probably will transcend what Hired Hand is all about all right. in its present stage. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, let's have a question. Uh, both you and your sister have been socially aware, it seems like, uh, most of your life, or at least a lot longer than before the masses were. And um, I was wondering, your sister is still very involved in uh, a lot of demonstrations and activity, and you tend to, well, at least have given me the impression tonight, you kind of look at her as a fool for doing this, that uh, we're kind of living in a, a mass suicidal thing right now, and uh, there's nothing really you can do to stop anything, except you have mentioned that uh, making movies, you're trying to expose political views and so forth. And uh, what I was really wondering, um, you're talking about we're foolish to be here tonight, we should be out doing something about the air and all. I was wondering, is there anything um, you personally feel that you might be able to do besides going to Africa for clean air and making movies? Or have you kind of given up or have no ideas yet on that? Well, the first part of the question was my sister. Um, the only thing, if it sounds like I'm putting, I put her down, it's because I find that she exposes or espouses causes that are not her own. They're outside of herself. And the only way that what you say will have weight and stimulate and make people act instead of react is if the cause is within you. Now about what I'm up to, well, after I've died, pass a judgment on it. Uh, while I'm doing it, uh, you must know that I'm thinking about these things much more seriously than you are, lad, because I have more responsibilities in them, not only through my editorial power of being somebody that somebody w will come and listen to or go and watch or whatever, but of my two children. And um, I can shoot well like the rest of them. But I don't see that that's an answer, or blowing up buildings, or making any kind of demonstration. It's useless. It's wasted energy. I don't know what the answer is, but I know that the question is important. And I know that we're not even asking the right questions. And I know that from high school students who are jamming smack in their arms, and I know that from college students who won't ask their teachers if they've read the book, and from weathermen and panthers. Panthers came and asked me for 2,000 bucks, or two, uh, two black dudes who said they were Panthers. I said, sure, give me a bazooka and 250 rounds of ammunition. The guy, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, that's what he wants the two grand for. Do you think that there's any action to be taken that way? Do you think there's any resolution? Breakfast for children, that's bullshit. Breakfast for children? Well, I gave my money to Luke McKissick instead, who was defending them in court for free. <laughs> because McKissick is not out there to kill anybody, but he's out there to def defend somebody's rights, and his action is not reaction. And I'm putting down their food programs at all. You're just not digging what I'm saying. Or maybe you have something to say, and you'd rather come up here and share this mic and say it. Or maybe you want me to say it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, at the risk of, uh, of doing something like the emperor's new clothes, you know, like where there is. Uh, what's is there the book? More water? <laughs> is there any more water? You <laughs> see, I told you, three and a half years. Well, I was foolish. It was less yeah. than an hour, and we ran out of water. <laughs> Nebby, I'm sorry, I bought. I didn't mean to. Uh, there's no more water. <laughs> no. Uh, you can drink wine. Ah, oh, pass the wine or a joint or something for crying out. Give me, give me an axe. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to know was what you mentioned. You mentioned the book. I was wondering what what is the book? What what book? Which book? Uh, <laughs> when did I? In what context did I mention it? In other words, have you asked your professors if they've read the book? And I, I whatever book I heard it you is. say it last time, and I didn't want to ask you because I thought I should know. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. <laughs> What's the Thank book? You, man, you understand it? Uh, well, let's say now. Hmm. Here's a good one. Hmm. <laughs> the University of California Press, uh, which, by the way, is owned by the Regents of the University of California, 
Bung, which is one of our governors, <laughs> put out a book called uh, Don Juan, A Yaki Way of Knowledge. That's a pretty good book. Now, I meant by um, the book, anything, uh, whatever you have to prepare class for. Uh, class is supposedly the formation of a, a group of people in which a learning process will take place. By this time, we're all, we're all supposed to have learned the tools of learning, reading, writing, and the basic tools of perception of words and ideas and creative thought. But I find more and more it's just like uh, answer, reading the book to prove that you understood the book and answering the question to prove that you understood the question. But there's more to be done than that. And uh, all the energy I can see lies with the young people. And if they're wasting it answering stupid questions that have already been answered because they're in the back of the book, yeah. did, or didn't you notice? Yeah, well, it's yeah. basically you read the book and then for, the test comes and you barf. And uh, that's the answers. I don't know. You see, there's, you just have to promote a question. You have to find the right question. It's a slow process at first. And there have to be fewer than uh, 300 people in a class to get it together. Um, Learning is freedom, and learning is what you're all supposed to be doing. And you're not going to get there by books, but you get there by asking questions. Here's a question, uh, right here. Can you stand up? I needed an axe. I was telling the cat the truth. Somebody give me an axe. There's, there's some more. Do you know what's in the water? I mean, really, do you know what's in this water? <laughs> All that stuff. Amoebas, you know. What's in the grass? What's in the grass that I smoke or in the papers that it's rolled in? <laughs> well, you know. The best. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's have a question over here. That wasn't mine, it was his. <laughs> he smokes the best. Would you comment on Al Cap's letter in Playboy? How much of it is true? And just, you know, general comment on it. Well, you know, first of all, of course I've got a bell around my neck. <laughs> I mean, I make a lot of noise when I move around, and, you know, that's part of my gig. In the Monopoly game and out of the mo Monopoly game. And as far as uh, him feeling that uh, I should have only a pea shooter, well, I know what he's got. <laughs> And, um, man, if he ever tries to booger around with me, I'm going to keep it straight for me and my two children and my lady. And things are going to get pretty hairy in this country, and so I'm prepared to keep it straight. So Al, whatever he has to say, you know, I, I, it was interesting to me that he bothered to take the time out to write that long letter, <laughs> you know. Are you going to take your guns with you to Africa? Mm -mm. I'll have a Hawaiian sling. I'm a fish, and I'll kill a fish and eat it. And I'll pull a carrot out of the ground, knowing that another carrot won't grow there, and eat it. What part? And of I'll Africa? kill the deer when I have to. What part of Africa do you want to go to? I mean, what part of Africa doesn't have very bad social oppression? Madagascar's poverty. pretty good, I'm told. Well, whenever the vanilla crop fails, they're in a lot of trouble. It depends. Uh, some dude came along. Uh, long up to my boat the other day and looked at it and he says far out man what a big materialistic trip this is you sure you know what you're up to man and I said well I had a choice I could have a farm and uh, he says yeah but you know how much work there is to keep this kind of a thing going and I said yeah you know how much work there is to keep a farm up to feed just my own family Uh, somehow or another, I disagree with you. I think this country is going to get better. I think in a couple of years, the government is going to start assuming responsibilities for problems that are long overdrawn. And why don't you stick around and see what happens? Is, They're going to shoot really, we're, we're in such a mess now. We get any further, and the government's going to become is going to get more bogged down in its own stupidity. And you're, you're, you know, Lyndon Johnson resigned. You know, I mean, like if Lyndon Johnson can resign, Nixon <laughs> can be defeated, and so on. You know, it's like it's not hopeless. That's true. But are you going to stop driving a car or whatever? You know? I don't drive a car. Oh, flush it, John. Hmm? Well, that's... <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to lay it out to you straight enough for you to understand. Plant. It's that's got nothing, nothing to do with America, lad. We could be sitting in England, I'll still say the same thing, or 
France or Germany, as long as there are Englands and France and Germany's and Americas and Russia's and China's and all that, we're all fucked. And we've blown it because we don't know that we're just people. We're waiting for Nixon's or me or some other dummy to come along and tell everybody what to do. We've got to do it ourselves. Listen, if you get out there and do it yourself, you can look right to your left or right and you'll see somebody else out there with you doing it themselves. Well, that, that seems to be my point. Rather than leaving, why not stay and help to get it done? Here I am. Do you see me right here? Yeah, but you're, you have plans to leave when it gets... When you ask me about that when I've left. Mm. Am I a policeman? No. Do <laughs> you believe him? Do I believe him? What was your question? That you're leaving. I don't know. Ask it. I'm an actor. My whole gig is theatrics. Yeah. I have my way of saying what I have to say. You can criticize it any way you want to, but I'm still going to do it the way I do it. And I'm not going to ask you how to do it for me. All right, can we have the next question, please? Uh, yes, uh, I was going to ask you a question about Easy Rider. It seemed to me that there is a lot of external... Could you speak up? Um, there's a lot of uh, very heavy usage of, like, the word man uh, quite a bit. And I was just wondering if you were just trying to make a comment on our social mores and the way we kind of every conversation is spread out with about a hundred ride-ons or far outs or whatever. <laughs> I mean, uh, it just seemed that like it, you were trying to make a point about it. Like it, uh, there's one scene where uh, you just say good night, man, and you know, good morning, man. And then <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to speak a lot of words on film. That's basically it. And uh, I was just wondering, could you say what your part was in the uh, last movie? Yeah, I played an actor making a movie for two weeks in Peru. Which that was far that, the farthest thing out. <laughs> what am I, you're right, what am I doing with this thing anyway? <laughs> right here. I don't want to get in a big thing about your justifying your life or anything, but this, this relates back to the, your last answer about not getting people like Nixon and you to solve our problems. Uh, I also don't care if you make a lot of money uh, making films that you think are important. Or there's something I'm curious about. It seems like one of, one of the problems of our society is that, it's such a pers that personality cults are so important that people think in terms of god figures and heroes and astronauts and things like this. Uh, like I said, I don't care about making money for movies. However, uh, I want to know how you feel about posters and things like this. Uh, there are about 10 different posters of you out. Uh, it embarrasses me. That, well, have you had anything to do with it, or, or can you stop them or anything? Because it seems yeah, like we try to stop it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We have, you know, legal actions taken, but they bootleg it out anyway. There's more than ten. You mean all those posters are made without your approval or knowledge? That's right. That's cool. There's 38 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you go right here? Uh, an easy rider. Captain America was super cool, I think, and above normal. Uh, <laughs> he had all the groovy lines, and you hired a prostitute and talked to her. I think this is unrealistic. I'd like to know. <laughs> I'd like to know why he was portrayed this way in the movie. It was two and a half years ago, man. <laughs> I don't. I don't know why. You know, that's Captain America just going along, not saying anything. That's the silent majority. The stars and stripes forever. Get the flag together, boys, and they'll take care of it. So, like, uh, that didn't have any meaning in itself. It was just the, uh, the character himself acted that way, huh? Well, the original idea of Captain America was this dude who was, like, evil Knievel. He did motor... No, it's serious. And he did motorcycle tricks. And the original opening of the film was me uh, riding through this long, burning building. And as I rode through it, the building collapsed right behind me. And then I would go up a ramp and crash through a big burning frame full of uh, Excelsior on fire and go out the other side. 
And my final act at the end of this supposed circus or rodeo or wherever we were giving the performance, me and Hopper, and Hopper was supposed to be my sidekick mechanic. As my final act, I come out in a flag draped coffin and blow myself up. It takes 26 of dynamite. As long as 18 of them go off, I'm all right. But if three in a succession, you know, three of them right together don't go off, I go pow right out that hole in a billion pieces. And Bert Schneider, who was the executive producer of the film, he said he wouldn't give us the money if we did that trick. Because I insisted on doing it, because I wanted to go out and say hello and get in the coffin on a master. So you could see it was me in the coffin and pow. That was the original concept. So a Captain America was a reality. And uh, as far as the evil Knievel is a reality, a person in with a name. And we didn't have time or money to shoot that. And we liked it better confusing people and announcing through the jail door. Wait a minute. You can't do this, parading without a permit. Don't you know who this is? This is Captain America, and I'm Bucky. And Marvel Comics sued us and say, you can't call him Bucky, you've got to call him something else. So we called him Billy, which was all right, too. OK, uh, can we go here for a question? Um, I was wondering what you are doing about, like you said, there's not going to be any water in three and a half years. Are you trying to do anything about this? Oh, I am or doing something about leaving? it. I am doing something about it. What are you doing? I'm not going to tell you. Can I ask why? But do you know what the, why? Why do you ask me what I'm doing about it? Are you finding a way for yourself? I'm trying to. Well, you're asking the right question. But if you keep asking yourself that question, you'll find out what to do about it because you'll I find out what the problem really question. is. Pardon? I ask myself that question. Well, when the more you ask yourself the question to be quiet about it, you know, and really almost meditate the question, and you'll find out what the problem really is, and then you'll know what your action is. And you won't have to come to anybody else and ask them what to do. Well, this, this, this whole thing has just been getting on a really weird track. People have been asking pretty stupid questions. And so I thought I'd just get off something like that and, you know, start talking about this, you know, ecology thing. Well, my old lady's a Shackley distributor. You know what that is? No. Okay. And um, I get out and boogie with people who uh, are in positions of power, heads of companies and so forth, and ask them why they don't do something about it. I talk to government people. Um, and I do much more than that, but uh, it's not something you can do, so that's the wrong question. Just take my word for it that I'm doing something. Okay, uh, can we go over here? Yes, um, I was wondering uh, what uh, motorcycles uh, do to uh, the ecology of the country. Just how does that fit in? Well, however many cc's less they are than a Volkswagen. There's still, uh, still more in a bicycle. Why don't you ride a bicycle? I mean, you know, you know like, uh, you know, why, why do you ride a, a motorcycle instead of a I bicycle? don't ride a motorcycle. Now, I drive a truck which is even more than a motorcycle. The truck puts out a lot of junk in the air. But do you know how much junk is put out in the air to make these microphones work and these lights work and make the motion picture projectors that show the movies I do work? Yeah, a hell of a lot less than a motorcycle. No, no, a hell of a lot more than a motorcycle. I think you're wrong. Well, when you understand what it is to create electric power, then you can understand the question you asked me. I think I do uh, understand the question that I'm asking. I'm uh, a senior in engineering. You use hydroelectric power to make electricity. <laughs> well, if you're a senior in engineering and you think that there's less pollution put out by my motorcycle than there is about what's running all the lights in this college, then I, you've asked I the wrong do. question in class. I think that that is a fact. I think that. Uh, uh, you know, I hate to be uh, obstinate about it, but uh, um, something like 60 to 70 percent of the pollution is uh, caused by uh, moving vehicles and not by stationary sources in Los Angeles County. I mean, it's well documented. It's not, a, not something that I just made up or something. Right. Uh, and, you know, like motorcycles do, do pollute. I'm just asking you why the hell you ride a motorcycle instead of, you know, like say if you're in this ecology kick and so I'll help on... Uh, ecology and water and stuff, and you go zooming around on a motorcycle. I just think that's a contradiction. Well, I don't have a motorcycle, like I said. I have a truck, and that's worse than a motorcycle, but I have a boat that uses air. I suppose I could take on a position like Yasha Heifetz and drive an electric car. 
But then somebody had to build that car with industrial power, which is also polluting things. It's a big circle, man. I don't know. But I know if I tried to walk here, I never would have made it because I have a bad cold. <laughs> well, you know, if you feel that way, either ask me the, the right questions so the silly answers don't come out or boogie on out of here, man. Thank you. Uh, we have a question over here. Ask right. the right question. Huh? I just wondered with uh, this obvious concern for air and water and its pollution, uh, or the pollution of it, I wondered if uh, you feel any guilt from flying in airplanes and driving in cars and how you handle <laughs> that guilt if you do feel any. <laughs> well, I don't do, do a lot of it. At least I do, uh, I do the least amount of it as I can. I like sailing the boat which uses wind best. I wonder about my own uh, excretion. Do you, do you find it necessary to fly? And why? I mean, I, th well, I think I flying I uh, really pollutes the air and the ocean to such an extent that maybe we should worry. And adding to uh, the success of airlines doesn't seem to do anything to avoid the problem of pollution in the skies. No, but the know, airlines are not going to fail unless you stop buying tickets, right? There will be, always be airlines when you're buying tickets. Well, uh, you should see the amount of people that are flying on the, some of the flights and know that they're also flying mail, packages, and other, all those, uh, sorts of other things beneath us. Uh, they make much more money in freight than they do in passenger service. I don't know if that's an answer or not. But well, I don't know, you know, what else to say to you about it. Well, I, I just wondered if you felt any guilt in how you handled it. That was really the question. I think about it. Okay, thanks. No, no, I, I think about it, man, like um, I haven't thought yet about, I'm guilty about the fact that I'm flying the plane and I know how much pollution it puts out. I'm thinking about the people who think they're flying first class and the people who f think they're flying coach and economy. As long as somebody wants to ask a question, it's All right. cool. Uh, we have a question over here. What's the best movie you ever saw besides your own? Well, I don't know if that even ranks among the best movies I ever saw. There's so many different movies, it's hard to say. You know, I. Four come right off the top. Potemkin, Grapes of Wrath. Um, all different kinds of films. F films that you probably never have seen. Animal Crackers was good. Uh, I can't tell you. What's, what's the best one you've seen in the past six months? The best film I've seen in the Which past six months? What would you recommend? What would I recommend? Well, I really haven't seen any films in the last six months other than Nicholson's film, Five Easy Pieces, because I've been working very hard on my own flick, too, and doing other things. Thank you. Yeah, let's go over here. Yeah, uh, well, irregardless of your political and ecological beliefs or anything, I think, you're a, I think you're a good movie maker and everything, but I was wondering if I might ask you a specific question about Easy Rider, and that was the character that you played, Captain America. It seemed that he... Uh, throughout the picture had uh, a disinterest in the opposite sex and I'm referring to the scene at the commune where like Dennis Hopper was going around trying to make it with all the girls and you were just sitting by and then at the uh, with the prostitute and I was wondering if this was some kind of a symbolism or just a gimmick or what no you know, Dennis Hopper tries to go around and make it with every chick he sees and I sit around and it all happens the way it should <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't I'm not worried about it Okay, can we have a question here? Yeah. How, uh, how do you and your sister uh, get along with your old man? <laughs> how does anybody get along with their old man? Sometimes fine, sometimes not so fine. Well, I mean, does he feel at ease when he goes to see his grandchildren and, and you know, stuff like that? Well, he very rarely comes over to see his grandchildren. Isn't that a drag? No, not for me. 
Uh, he feels ill at ease coming to see me. I'm his child. Um, he felt ill at ease seeing me from the time I was born, I think. But that's not a, that's a fault that we all have. He didn't know how to relate to himself. How could he possibly relate to me? What, what did he think of Easy Rider? He liked Easy Rider. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I heard him say he liked it, but I was, a I was asking you whether he really liked it. Yeah, the first time he saw like four hours of it or something like incredible, the first cut was an immense, <laughs> an immense flick. He said he wished he knew where we were going. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, why don't you have a scene in there where you say, well, we're going to go here and do that. And I said, well, why don't you watch the film and you'll see where we go and you'll see what we do. And that's the last question you asked me about it. <laughs> All right, we have a question here. Do we? Right. Yeah, it appears from your Playboy interview that you had great uh, suicidal tendencies as a child. I was wondering if these tendencies have manifest themselves in your later life, like... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy will tell you they do because they just smoked a cigarette. And the other guy will say they do because they fly in planes. Drink the water or whatever, you know, smoke dope. Um, suicidal tendencies. Do you really want me to answer that question? Was your childhood really, was it pretty bad? I mean, it just... Uh... Oh, listen, you got to go see some people who have bad childhoods. <laughs> I had a pretty interesting one. It had its problems and it forced me into some problems and uh, I had to eat some of my own stuff. But, um, no, there are people who have had some bad childhoods. Okay. Uh, right over here, please. I'd like you to rap with us about bikes and where your head's at. Not on a pollution thing. But Could just, you, you speak know, up, please? Did you say bikes, man? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, what you really feel about them now, because Easy Rider was kind of, I felt like a different idea than the way you really feel about them. Well, although I don't ride movie. one now, I should like bikes. Pardon? I like bikes. Right. I like, like bike riding. I especially like to ride out in the country. Like it's a good way to get out. I got real high riding motorcycles, but uh, I don't ride anymore. Not from an ecology standpoint, just pure survival. Could you recommend the film Joan Baez's uh, Carry It On then? Haven't seen it, you know, yeah. but I can recommend Joan Baez and her old man a lot. Great. Now there's somebody to, to listen to, David Harris. Uh, we have a question over here. Uh, I'd like to know how I can split to South Africa too without having to involve myself in all the bullshit of having to make all the money, because I don't have it. <laughs> well, if you learn how to navigate well, maybe you'll get a ride on my boat. <laughs> if I learn how to... <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a way. Well, I've been looking for a long time, but I haven't found a very good answer yet. So how old are you? 24. Oh. Well, I'm 30 and I'm looking still, and I haven't found the answer yet. I'm not sure I understand the whole problem either. Well, South Africa doesn't sound bad, but it's tough. Well, to I didn't know. say South Africa, lad. Well, whatever Africa you said. Okay, we have a question over here. Yeah, two-part question. I was wondering uh, first if your uh, if the number S six seven nine. Seven one five three one eight seven. Is Don't even say anything else. What? It's not true. It's not true. Okay. No, it hasn't been true, and I get okay. bothered by the phone company <laughs> <laughs> who call me up and say, "Is this your number?" And I said, "Listen, you dummies, you're the assholes. So give me the number. You ought to know whether it's my number or not. Don't bother me anymore." But I get calls from Toronto. Is it all right that this cat uses your number? I said, "One number," and they give me that S six three nine four. Like, no, man, it's way off. All right. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it. But it really surprises me. A phone company. Now, when I finally got so mad that I had my attorneys call and said that I would uh, say, forget it, and, you know, and uh, take all the phones out and all this stuff. Well, they said, well, we're in billing department. We don't know what they're up to in that department over there. But, you know, they got a phone. <laughs> he doesn't have a number. He uses Paul Newman's number. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Everybody in my office uses Paul Newman's number. We're all on to his number. 
Oh, listen, it took us a while to get it. You guys got to do a little work for something like that. All right, uh, do we have another question over there? Yes, I was wondering... Could you speak up, please? I was Stuff wondering... that thing right in your mouth. <laughs> really, don't be afraid of your right upon to it and talk like this. I was wondering if uh, you had any idols that you could kind of relate that, you know, reason we came maybe to hear you was because you kind of maybe symbolize something that we that we think is good and if, is this is this okay to have an idol like that? Yeah, if it's you. Yes, it's okay to have an idol if it's you. Well, that's it. It's not it. I mean, you could take some of the... I mean, do you see why people would come to see you? I mean, you kind of put them down for coming, but that... Um, oh, no, I said I didn't mean to insult you. No, I, I know you were not I was just saying wouldn't. that uh, for theatrical effect. It seemed to me an interesting question because you can't all be interested in filmmaking, which is what my gig is. I think you represent something more than filmmaking. What I represent is what you see in me. That's the Peter Fonda that you know. Okay. Okay, let's move, let's bogey right on over here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fonda, we realize that there are big changes going on in Hollywood and filmmaking. The system is weakening. Have you heard about the system of uh, taped cassettes of films which will be plugged into televisions and what effect, do you think that this will have a big effect on filmmaking in Hollywood? And if so, what effect and how do you plan to adapt to it? It'll have a great effect on filmmaking everywhere. Uh, there'll be great porn flicks, for an example. All those old geeks who won't go down to uh, the Los Feliz, or not, that's the wrong theater, sorry. <laughs> Whatever the name of those theaters are. Monica. The Monica, yeah. Whatever it is, it just, they won't put you on down there because they don't want to be around those freaks and all that stuff. But they'll buy that cassette and slip it in their television set. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be a big uh, boon politically and um, so awesome. forth. You can make any kind of statement you want. Um, it'll help out First Amendment a, a great deal as far as filmmaking is concerned and censorship. Also, it'll give a lot of jobs to actors and filmmakers and directors and sound men and the technicians and so forth because we haven't got them. Right, and if you got a cassette, you don't have to carry a raincoat in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, could we have a question here? Um, the idea of escaping, sailing on a boat away from uh, this Listen, kind that's of the way you see it, man. No, no, wait, I'm just, I want to add. No, I was just saying it sounds a lot like uh, the song Wooden Ships, you know, David Crosby. Oh, he's, yeah, right, it is. Have you talked with him at all? Yeah, he's a close friend. We raft up together when he had his, has his boat down here. I like sailing. I'm a fish, I like to be on the ocean. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to get a boat where I could take some friends with me, like my la lady and my two children. But I would have gone in a 20-foot boat. And it's not escaping because uh, it's the surround thing that we live on. There's no way I can escape it. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, one here. What prevents you from shooting a great ecology movie, a great ecology film? Why don't you do it? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I had planned to shoot as my next flick, an ecology flick about the world, you know, about the, uh, every country in the world. And my biggest problem, um, production-wise, was getting out of China. Getting what? Getting out of China. Uh -huh. You know where that is? Well, they don't teach that in colleges in the U.S., but it's a place see, in the world where about a quarter of the population in the world exists. Uh, and then this script got laid on me that was a fictional script. And it uh, has the impact uh, that I would like to have in film that leaves people asking questions. So that we're going we're to do that one next. Thank and you. that's an ecology film, but it's a fictional film. Yeah, I think we have a final question over here. Yeah, I just stopped in. I was studying in a library, and I heard like about a series of five or six questions, which really seemed like everyone was trying to put every... We were trying to put... Or people here were putting you on a bad trip, and you were putting us on a bad trip. So 
I want to ask a general question in that everyone here probably has their own perspectives on you know what's going on and, and what is happening and I guess the reason I'm asking a question is to is to interact with what like your personal hopes are for the world and your personal hopes are for the industry and what you're doing and so, so I, mine can interact with yours, not so I can put yours down and not so yours will put mine down, but just so I can hear what you have to say. When I go out to make a movie, I'm interacting with a lot of people. A lot of people. You understand that? It's not like being a, a musician with a guitar and a microphone or a poet with his pen and so forth. There are a lot of people that I depend upon to be right there with me. It's like having a gigantic orgy. It can be, too, really uh, orgiastic. Not that I get a sexual pleasure from it, but I get a certain amount of enjoyment. Uh, that's working together with people. I mean, we work together very hard. And uh, when we can get together so heavily so that 40 or 50 people are on the same trip without speaking the same language even. And some people having to nail up stuff against the wall and other people getting to be creative and say words. We're all part of it. We're all making the same baby. Now the same thing holds true with social action. We can all get together. It's very possible to get together. You know, the only thing that keeps us from getting together is fear. Fear brings us together in a different way. Getting together is, is a phrase that I'm using. Coming together uh, is what Nixon said. Uh, well, fear makes us stick together behind a flag or a gun or a leader. What is it that Jack Nicholson said in that movie that's two and a half years old? The herd instinct. And anybody outside the herd has to be done in. It's very difficult to get together with as many people as was in this room when we started. Um, first of all, there's a microphone and lights between us. There's many things set up, preconceptions of me from you, because you all think you know me, and I don't know me. Uh, and there's all sorts of other things. But if we were together in a smaller group, where a dialogue could really happen, and after hysterics and all that calmed down, Something could be done. Some action could take place rather than reaction. Not planning how to blow up a building, but planning how to do something else. I don't know, planning is the wrong word. Understanding the problem better. Because I think that that's the whole gig, understanding the problem. And once you do, you just move on to the next problem. And if you keep on doing that, your mind expands so greatly that pretty soon you have a lot of energy you're giving out because you're really in there with the problem and you can't help but affect other people. But the only way you're going to get there is with somebody else interacting. I think there's one Thank or two you. more. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, Peter, I was wondering, you said before that you would have to be a fool to pass go without collecting the $200. And I take it that you do evidently, although you may dislike it, recognize the power of money in this country. As I understand it, uh, the UCLA speaker program pays its speakers. I was wondering. No, he didn't. They don't. No. They don't pay their speakers at all. Well, we do, but we don't pay him. Uh, okay, then. Well, I was. I, was I demanded they pay me in gold. You see, and that's an illegal illegal action in the United States. I said I want a twenty dollar gold piece. <laughs> no, no uh, seriously, I don't care. I was He's paying us. That's right. I was right. wondering then, are there any organizations that you, uh, any ecology organizations that you support? and you think are doing something about uh, that, are doing something about the ecology problem and that might need some of your money and I was wondering whether you don't Yeah, anything. Shackley. Shackley is an organization that does something about it. I am an organization uh, in my own mind, my own body and my temple. Although I fly in planes, as that guy said, and I drive a motorcycle and smoked cigarette then, didn't I? <laughs> I don't, there's no cigarettes in my house, man. I'm not smoking a lot of cigarettes, but I understood the question. Uh, yeah, Shackley is something you should get into if you want to know what it's all about. Do you know about um, 
the big giant tankers that are flushing themselves out in the South Atlantic. The oil tankers, they're really huge too, and they carry a lot of oil, and they have to clean themselves out, just like you have to clean a toilet bowl or something. Well, they use detergent soap to clean themselves out, and it kills all the life in the water. And then they have another, uh, another thing that's happening. They're farming fish to feed people, and they use these big steel nets, and they just drag them right through the schools of fish and chop them all up at one time. What they've been doing is catching 50,000 porpoise a, a week. Somebody told me a day, so I'm going to say a week because I don't think that that many porpoises. But uh, 50,000. Do you know that no country in, in the world, in spite of all of our political bullshit and bureaucratic action, no country has ever fished porpoises. And when somebody has boogered one up with a boat by accident or one has washed ashore or something, uh, there's a place in West Africa where they bury them with the people because they think they're people. That's a pretty interesting gig. That was laid on me the other day. It was uh, along with the, the big tankers because I'm trying to get Shackley to come up with a product that is a biodegradable and non-detergent that they can use to flush out the tankers because I know that's the, the first attack. Although it would be better if the tankers stopped pushing the fossil fuels around and then we found a different way for energy than fossil fuels. Whether it works in the cars or the electric plants doesn't make any difference. It's fossil fuels. All right. Uh, there's one more question. See, didn't you ask me, man, by the way, why don't I put myself a few feet under and let the worms get to me while you were sitting down here? What I said well, was... I am my excretion. No, no what I said, yeah, you were talking about your excretion and that uh, you asked him over there whether, you know, he ever thought about not flushing the john. And I was just wondering, you know, like, you say that there are no things that you can do and you even mentioned uh, Yasha Heifetz and, and the electric car. And I say that, or like, I was wondering whether you would agree that a man with your editorial power and your money might be able to make a bigger influence on people and actually take, a, take not just a stand, it would take you know, a lot of adjustments in your own life, but I say dig a hole and cover it, 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 you know, it decomposes. Rather than, dirty, rather than dirtying the stream, just dig a hole and shit. Yep. Um, that's what I do when I'm not here. But uh, if I did that here, they'd arrest me. When I die, I have it set up so that I can be put half a foot under the soil. That means that I'll decompose right away uh, and be eaten up by the worms and all that. And they'll be eaten by other things and I'll become a bush a lot sooner. Uh, dig all those stiffs that are in lead-lined coffins. Forest lawn, the forest lawn takes care of everything beautifully. Oh, you, you might become a weed and somebody will smoke you. That's beautiful, man. Can you imagine <laughs> that? <laughs> I could really dig, man. <laughs> nice big buds, you know. <laughs> All right, do we have a, another question? Yeah, Peter, uh, the day of the Woody Guthrie Memorial, I talked to you during the rehearsal in that afternoon, and uh, you said that you felt that the two guys in Easy Rider committed suicide. Would you explain that again? Well, in s symbolically, if I'm Captain America, I represent all of America, silent majorities, I said, and so forth, and the dope smokers and the long hairs and the short hairs and the machine freaks and the everything else. And um, if you notice, after the fellow pulls the trigger at me, and uh, the bike blows up, and there's a long pull away with a helicopter shot, the truck's gone too, everything's gone, except for the machine just burning there. And we committed suicide uh, by thinking that getting a lot of money together and getting someplace else, whether it was Florida or Africa, and that being freedom. I was wondering, that was a wrong premise, but that's the premise that our country is based on. I was wondering if you noticed uh, in Easy Rider, there was a scene where you were in that little commune there, and you were running through the rocks, uh, and there was, there was, the reflector was following you. You know, it was like that was Dennis. Oh, that was, oh, when Dennis. he was walking yeah, past and the people. Yeah, there was a You could see a reflector mark on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't always be perfect. 
Cameraman's yeah. the only one who kicks himself for that. I don't <laughs> mind. I love it. I see. Look at that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You've been putting down politics a lot and saying it's a load of shit and everything. Yeah. Uh, I personally have a lot of respect for your sister. This is my question. You, you've also been talking about uh, self-liberation and getting yourself and your wife and your kids to Africa and, and su supporting yourselves and everything. The problem is, uh, like that guy asked a while ago, th there's millions of people who can't go to Africa, who can't pass go and collect $200 for being oppressed by the system. Uh, all over the In fact, you, whether you talk about ecology, whether you talk about oppression, whether you talk about wars that are stupid, this all comes under the same system. Now, You're a part the, of that system, lad. Right, okay, cool. Everybody is. The thing is, uh, it seems to me that to the extent that you believe in just getting yourself together and your wife and your kids and everything and going off to Africa and putting down people who are trying to change the system, you're condemning the people who can change the system, who are suffering under it economically, maybe not you know, psychologically, of course, as well, but, but people are starving. Uh, what, what is your solution for, for how these people get themselves together? Because you can't get yourself right together while you're starving or while you're being killed by cops or killed by ch soldiers or anything. What's your answer to these people? What's my answer for those people? Well, you know, if I can feed them, I feed them. As far as being boogered by the cops, well, they've hit me on the head too, lad, and thrown me in chains in jail. Um, I won't have any more confrontations with them. They're violent and irrelevant, even though they're part of society. Uh, I won't have any confrontations, really violent ones, with anybody anymore. I won't promote that thing inside my body, which I was born with, that violence and that struggle. My whole gig with myself is to be free. Not free from you or free from them, just free. It's very simple. Well, what do you have to say about these people though? I mean, again, like it's cool that you can be free and, and you may be able to achieve it. Well, However, you think that's because I have the bread? Well, that's a step in the right direction. Like, if you, you're starving and, and things like this, then, then you don't have time to, to get your head together and, and travel where you want and live where you want and go where it's better. I'm talking about at least the people who are, who are acting like your sister is and, and like other people who are trying to change the system are, are, are interested in... Well, I'm, sh I'm not saying you're not interested, but are trying to do something about, about these people who, who, because of conditions, can't do as much for themselves. What, what do you say to these people? How do they get themselves together? Well, I think um, if they begin to grasp the problem, which is all our problem, not just feeding them, although that's their immediate manifestation of the problem, that they have a chance to act. Anything else is reaction. Uh, I don't try to do anything, man. I do it. Try is a negative word. Try already means that you don't think it may happen. If I tried to do Easy Rider, we never would have made it. Or Dennis, as crazy as he is. We just do it. Now, however we do it, however my sister does it, however uh, any of the outlaws do it, or the in-laws, But if you've seen them act in action, and you've been real close with them, close enough where they want you in there or out there or something, you'll know that they're all doing the same thing, no matter whether their hair is long, they've got beards, or whether they're Spiro Agnew or Dennis Hopper, they're all on the same trip. They don't recognize it, but they are. So they have to change, we have to change. All of us have to change, and it has to be something immediate because it needs all of our attention. It's not simply feeding people who are starving. Okay, uh, is there, can we squeeze one more question? I've been disappointed by a lot of movies I've seen recently, and I know a lot of my friends and 
probably a lot of the younger people that go to movies load up before they go in just to enjoy the movie, catch it under the sight or sound or something like this. And I was wondering how long it'll be before the movie industry catches on to this scene and puts out a movie specifically to get loaded with, including stereophonic sound, audio, visual, everything, sort of on the way of Fantasia was put out, uh, but it wasn't put out for that purpose. Do you think this is a thing that's going to be coming? Well, you know, I only heard half of what you said. Uh, Could you rephrase it or, right. or do it again slowly? Well, I, I've been disappointed by a lot of movies I've I seen. I got that part of it. Right, okay. I'm so right people load then. up and they go to movies. Yeah. And uh, specifically to get loaded with, you know, or to go in when you're high. As soon, and as, uh, as, soon as the filmmakers understand kinesthetic approach to uh, stimulating an audience, uh, uh, instead of approaching as a third-person relationship, as a right. first-person relationship, then that will happen right away. Well, the, the TV cassettes and so forth will give more people who have not got a preconception or uh, something else going up their sleeve a chance to uh, make it with film, which is does so many things to people, gets to so many people quickly, makes a point well if it's there to be made. Do you think it's a thing of the future and that you're opening up everybody's sensory perceptions and with audio, visual, and all these things, they can get a message across more pointed and that uh, in other words, do you feel within five years or so that this might be a form of media to a select group of people, not advertised as such, but that, you know, people understand what it's all about? Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I think it's going to certainly help out educational process as soon as they allow it into the educational process. Um, now, if they allow that educational process into the regular theaters, in other words, if it can make money, It'll happen for all of us. We'll all get involved with it. And uh, we'll all get a chance to make our own movies or participate in them. OK. Uh, uh, is it, do you have a question? Uh, OK. I don't have a question, but I would like to tell um, you about a mission that some friends of mine and I are going on. These are about 50 to 100 people. And we'll be going on a caravan from Venice to China. Um, Venice, on California? An artistic, pardon? Venice, California? No, Venice, Italy. Venice It'll, to China. It, it's called uh, the Marco Polo Caravan. And it will be an artistic mission and a peaceful mission, like several artists and actors and filmmakers and musicians and writers and poets will be going on the trip. And we'll all be producing our own work and working together as well as on an individual basis. Speak and closer to the microphone, stick it right up in your mouth. Okay, and we'll yeah. be doing um, our own films as well as working together and doing um, well, films on our projects and spiritual films as well. And this should, we should start going on our mission in June. And I just wanted to let you know that there are people that are planning to do something and not just try well, I, to do I, something. I know that. Don't, don't, take what I, don't take me as a pessimist all the way. As a okay. matter of fact, you must know that I am approached by everybody who has something to do. Yeah. Uh, not just for bread, but for participation in physical, in my own self, and two hands and all that. Um, and there's some pretty heavy things. And there's some heavy people that are in there doing it, too, and asking the questions. Uh, go right ahead, man. I, if I could be there, that would be vintage. I'd go with you. That would be great. I want to get to China. <laughs> My grandfather walked from the sea to the wall and back to the sea, and they won't let me in. Well, I, I know someone that you could talk to if you're really interested. Oh, I do too. Great, great. Yeah. But you see, they won't let me photograph things and take well, the film out. Well, and they um, wouldn't let me speak with the way I want to speak or see the people I'd like to see, which could be any place. Yeah, I can And do if I can't exercise it, then, you know, pow. Yeah, I can dig what you mean. You know what pow means? Pardon? You know what pow means? No, I don't. An old Hawaiian term means it's finished, like if you pass the pipe and there's nothing left in it. Well, it's pow. It's pow. It's a prisoner of war. Well, okay. P-A-U, pow. Oh. Oh. It's oh. finished, pow, because I'm really sick and I should yeah, spill down here. Okay, uh, you're all invited into the hall to have a drink of water. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're going to cut out. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>